Um, most of the participants here are actually professors that are currently working with us to put these courses together. Um, and you can visit our website, sailor.org, anytime um, and see what we are up to. I think we have about 220 courses that we've completed so far. Um, and we are beginning to put all of those courses through peer review and build additional assessments and expand into new areas of study. So we have a lot going on. Um, and I would encourage those of you who aren't familiar with what we're doing to take a look around. Um, really quickly, I um, wanted to once again mention that you can chat us any questions you guys have in the chat pane. Um, you can also raise your hand, I believe, and that will definitely let us know that you're having some kind of issue and we'll work to address that as quickly as we can. Um, and finally, I am recording this session as I just paused to turn that on. Um, so that we can make this available later and you can send it out to whoever you want. I think we'll probably upload it to our YouTube channel um, and we'll also be providing a link to it from our sailor.org blog. So if you go to the sailor.org webpage, you'll see our blog link um, and you should be able to find it there. Um, okay, so let's get started. Um, this is the second in our course design workshop series. Um, it, this is all about articulating and aligning learning outcomes in your course. Um, and I'm thrilled to welcome Ellen, Stephanie, Andy, and Emily, who are talented instructional designers from the Washington State Board for Community and Technical Colleges. Um, I'm sure that they will discuss this, but they um, have been working on a really cool project called the Open Course Library. Um, to build a suite of 81 um, very low-cost courses. Um, and they have been so helpful to us. And we actually have a few of their courses posted on our site that we've kind of taken what they've done and put it into the Sailor format. So um, I you know, encourage you guys to check that out. Um, and so I guess without further ado, I'd like to turn it over to Andy, who I think is going to be speaking first. Andy, do you want to take it from here? Will do. Um, before um, we get started, I'm Andy Williams, and I am one of the instructional designers on the Open Course Library Project, as are my colleagues. In addition to that, I uh, work in the business division at Edmonds Community College. And um, why don't I get uh, Ellen and Emily and Stephanie to uh, introduce themselves as well before we go forward? So, Ellen? Can everybody hear me? OK, great. I'm Ellen Bremen. I am faculty in the Communication Studies Department at Highline Community College. I've been at Highline. I believe I'm going into my eighth year. I seem to be losing track. And I am an instructional designer on the Open Course Library project. This year, I'm also serving in a quality assurance role. And I've been on the, I think all, yes, all four of us have been on this project now. This is our second year. Um, we're in phase, this is our, we were on phase, all on phase one. Uh, and this year, we're in phase two. So I'll, I'll move over to, to uh, Emily. Sure. So, hi, I'm Emily Wood. I, I'm going to have my webcam on for just a minute so you can see who I am. I'm a faculty librarian at Pierce College, Fort Silicon um, in Lakewood, Washington, and I am also an instructional designer in the Open Course Library. I primarily work with the math and science courses within the Open Course Library, and I think um, one of our one or two of the courses that I worked on with uh, Tyler Wallace from Phase One have been changed and formatted into Sailor courses. So I'm really excited to see what happens when you put things out and open, and and the creative things that can happen from that. So um, Sailor's doing great work, Open Course Library is doing great work, and I'm really excited to um, be here today. Hi, I'm Stephanie Delaney. I'm also an instructional designer on the Open Course Library, and I'm in the e-learning department at Seattle Central Community College. Um, I, too, am excited to be here joining you all. So thanks, all. Um, Andy here again. Um, before we uh, start talking about objectives and assessments, um, a little bit about the Open Course Library and, um, and our part. Um, in that, as well as um, 
once again reiterating what Jennifer said, and thanks again, Jennifer, for hosting us and inviting us. Um, this is going to be a, a, we want this to be a conversation and, and not just a one-way data dump. And, and uh, with the four of us, uh, we tend to be uh, a little bit of, you know, for lack of a better word, a free-for-all. So please, everyone feel free to jump in uh, whenever uh, you've got questions or want to add a comment. Um, Open Course Library started uh, a couple of years ago with uh, seed money from the Gates Foundation and from the Washington State Legislature with the goal of producing um, uh, open courses that covered the, the highest demanded courses in the state. And the, the stipulations were to uh, that faculty developers who were going to develop these courses uh, could use course materials that couldn't cost students more than $30 per course as well as uh, courses that, that met quality standards. We used a modified quality matters rubric um, when we were evaluating these courses and they also added to meet accessibility and, and uh, uh, global education standards. Um, as instructional designers, um, we applied the uh, uh, quality matters rubric in a modified form to the courses to make sure that uh, alignments uh, between objectives, assessments, learning materials and resources were being met. Um, and uh, as well as acted as project managers. And I see that Kelvin has a, a question here. Uh, are there plans to offer more open education resources for upper level courses um, in which publishers do not provide? Um, at this point, uh, we're focusing on the, the high demand courses, which also seem to be the ones that, that the publishers are, are targeting. Um, but I'm going to um, defer to my colleagues to see if they are aware of any other uh, uh, plans that are out there. Stephanie, Emily, or uh, Ellen? Um, I, I don't think that's within the scope of um, the current phase and the previous phase of Open Course Library, which has been focused on um, first and second level um, university level or university or community college level courses, um, and most of those are intro or or survey courses. But that would be great. And Kelvin, I agree that, that um, the, the publishers um, see a ready market there. Um, the, uh, the big push um, from our project has been to provide alternatives to the, uh, uh, the expensive textbooks that are out there, the Psychology 101 textbook that costs a student $150, $200. Um, and we're meeting with some success with uh, adoptions, um, but more so, uh, it's, I think it's a good idea to just kind of move this idea forward and, and give faculty the idea that there are alternatives or complements or supplements to the publisher uh, courses. Anyway, for those who are interested more in the Open Course Library um, project, you've got a link there on the slide to opencourselibrary.org and I encourage you to take a look there and uh, see what, what's offering. We, are, uh, we have phase one that is available to the, the world. The phase two, uh, uh, 40 some odd courses will be piloted this fall, uh, refigured and, and uh, um, retested as it were uh, come next winter and then will be available uh, spring of 2013 again to the world. So I'm going to move on forward here. Um, and the basis of um, our instructional design starts from that quality matters rubric and really with uh, the idea of uh, developing uh, objectives and teaching to objectives. And, and I'm going to be general about these and then, and then turn it over to my colleague Ellen to, to be more specific. But the general idea with, with the objectives is to think about to whom the, uh, the course is being designed for the students and with the idea of what do you want the students to be able to do, to accomplish, to demonstrate, and at what level, and then to design your objectives based on, in essence, that, those kinds of questions. So, you know, for instance, here we're looking at who are the learners and what do we expect them to be able to do, how are they going to demonstrate it, and at the level. And so 
Ellen, do you want to take uh, take this and, and uh, go into it in a little bit more depth, please? Sure. 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 I have an echo on my end. Okay, it's gone. <laughs> so I just wanted to add a little um, quick anecdote. My first degree is in post-secondary education, and I remember I graduated from the University of Nevada, Las Vegas, and Dr. Clifford McLean and Dr. Paul Meacham, who was the uh, former president of the, well, it was formerly the Community College of Southern Nevada, which is now Colleges of Southern Nevada, I remember that they took us through writing objectives in every possible way imaginable during that degree program. And I just remember that, you know, that A, B, C, D that, I'm, that Andy's presented here. And I'll, I'll tell you that more than my graduate work, I have drawn upon this method and this, um, what I learned in that program, I feel like I've drawn upon that in my 14 years of teaching more than I've drawn upon my master's in communication, honestly. I, I've been on assessment committees at the two colleges where I've been um, on tenure track. And I feel like this has changed my teaching and altered the way that I've taught so much, is just looking at um, just, again, coming back to the basics of who are our learners, what do we want them to do, what, you know, what conditions do we want them to be learning under, and what type of measurement or standard do we want our learners to, uh, to we, do we want them to be learning in. And so, I, so this is just a very basic example, and again, I, I believe that when we put these together, I went directly back to my undergraduate work, um, because I still have those notes from so long ago. And so this is the example that I was given way back when, uh, which you can read. And every time that I need to write objectives now, when we need to retool our course adoption forms, and uh, we just looked at those in, my, in our communication studies department not long ago for our 101 course, I literally go back to, this, to just this very basic format, and I try to just, just do this process all over again, and it helps me to use something this simple of this sort of A, B, C, D. So maybe this could be something that, that helps you too. And I'll give you another trick that Dr. McLean taught me in a minute um, that, that can kind of, or at some point in this, um, in this presentation, I'll tell you another trick that Dr. McLean taught me that kind of helps me think about, um, thinks about assess, it helps me think about assessment. So let's look at, um, let's look at another example. So I thought this one was um, this one was kind of fun, and it also you can see that there's a very specific um, there's there's it makes it very specific. And also when I think about the student, I, I always think about we always think about student centeredness. If a student looked at at their objectives, would they know exactly what is expected of them? And I try to think about that too. And what Dr. McLean used to say is, if you turned these into questions, if you started these off with "Can the learner?" So, so could the learner, if you turn these around and you turn these into questions, starting off with can the learner, if a student could ask themselves that question and they could understand it and, under, and comprehend, well, he, he used to say that understand is a bad word because you can't measure understanding, so I'm using the bad word. But if a student could figure out what they were expected to do, then you know that it's that it's a it's an objective that is it's an objective that is a viable objective. Andy, did you want to add anything at this point? I love the Jimi Hendrix treatment. Um, <laughs> The, the, the having it crystal clear to the students of what's expected to them and how they will be measured um, uh, is, is at the heart, I think, of, of our instructional design here. And I think that, that you stated it well, uh, Ellen, in, that, um, in how you presented the objectives. So um, nothing more to add than that. Thanks. Okay, so moving on. So now let's take a look at 
some actual objectives that we have seen. So this is where I invite everyone to, to weigh in. So what are some issues that, what are some issues that you see here? Andy, can't you, can't you describe the nature of the work? <laughs> can the learner describe the nature of the work? That's not measurable? OK, so not written from student perspective. Vague, exactly. <laughs> Introduce students. Which religion? My sense We've got the idea. Um, vague, um, not measurable, um, downright silly, describe the nature of work, and my comment was it's hard. <laughs> okay, well, just when you thought it was safe to go into the water, here are some more. I know it's as bad as understand. <laughs> so believe it or not, all of these are actual objectives that have been seen in, in, in actual classes. These are these are real. These have not been these have not been fabricated. Do you think they get worse? You ready? What's really interesting, and I think that I think that all of us as instructional designers would probably say the same thing, that even strong, I mean, even objectives are just difficult. They are difficult to write. And there are a lot of courses out there and a lot of strong, a lot of strong faculty out there who have just simply never, a, a lot of people just have simply never been trained on how to write on how to write course objectives I, I have seen it over and over again where because we run a summer institute at Highline um, and on our standards of standards outcomes and competencies committee we do a lot of work with faculty throughout the year and you just you just see you just see it over and over again and also being on this project getting to see objectives you know system wide that are going on it's just it's just very interesting and these are not necessarily from all th from throughout our system these are just from all over but it's just very interesting to see objectives that are out there that are that just that are just being used so let me move on so that's why this is so, so important. That's why this is so important. Because if you if you think we look at these, if 
most of things we get confused looking at these you can only imagine what our students think so now I'll go ahead and move move this over to Stephanie thanks Ellen um, another piece I wanted to add just on your comments about people not being trained on how to write learning objectives a lot of times people don't even think to write learning objectives you often inherit them from previous syllabi that other people taught and and just sort of never really look at them again and I think that that for many people the, the push towards alignment of um, outcomes is, is a new thing to even consider and actually reading one's learning objectives I, I've often had faculty just who hadn't even really read their objectives um, so it, it's a way that to, to get people to really think about them so sometimes it's not that they um, don't know how which often they don't that, that, that they haven't actually even really thought about it uh, when you do think about it, one of the things that can help is looking at the um, the verb wheel from Bloom. Oh, I see some chatter there in the chat. Is this is my audio not coming through very well? Is it okay? Okay, I see people saying it's okay. Um, I love this video, this visual of um, Bloom's taxonomy, and I'm sure you're all familiar with Bloom's and its layers of of knowledge and sort of the base of information that a student should have, and that that should um, grow in complexity as a student moves uh, through a topic. And it's helpful in in trying to determine whether the learning objectives that you have are appropriate for the level of your course. But it's also um, a really this particular graphic is a really great tool for aligning your outcomes with what you're having the students actually do and what you're actually having the students show what you know so that you can see whether they actually accomplished what you wanted so for example um, in the knowledge uh, region of the chart um, which is, is the base of the Bloom's pyramid you've got things like draw identify locate uh, label write repeat um, just some basic being able to you know basic ways of regurgitating information really and then how might they demonstrate those things um, in, in what types of assignments might you give to let them be able to do that labeling or repeating or drawing or identifying well you could do and if you look at that outer ring of the circle uh, you could have them do a recording, you could have them create a dictionary, you could have them uh, watch a TV show and identify things from there, uh, or write definitions or read definitions. Um, so all sorts of ways. And if you, as you look into the more complex area, so let's look over in the analysis corner, you see um, you know, comparing, debating, differentiating, and showing things by um, creating graphs, uh, do, having a, a broken down, breaking down an argument, or writing a report. Um, and I think that this is interesting because you often have people writing reports in intro level classes where you're expecting sort of sophisticated analysis for outcomes that are really based at the base level of Bloom's. So this really can help you align is what you're expecting from the students actually in alignment with what you're asking from the students and if those two are not lined up um, it's not surprising that sometimes people are disappointed with um, with what students produce so after you've sort of thought through the blooms you can look at your learning objectives and ask some of these questions and I won't read through them all but what it all comes down to is what can the student do and it sort of ties back to what Ellen had the, the question Ellen asked is is the student able to is the learner able to do X um, if you can't say what the student can do um, then your outcome is really lacking the detail that is necessary for it to be student focused and measurable I had a conversation uh, with a philosophy instructor the other day and I was um, asking him to be a little bit more detailed in the writing of his learning objectives and he was really quite offended and said that you know philosophy is not something where people can do something it's you know it's all about thinking he said and I said well you know thinking is doing something <laughs> and you know you need to it's important to the student to be able to understand the benefit of engaging in the thought that one does in philosophy and if he can't even articulate that 
then how can he really expect the students to be able to do it? And how can he expect to be able to measure whether the students can do it? Um, after uh, he got over being mad at me, he realized that it did make sense. And that when he finished, um, he was a lot happier with his class. So here's uh, some more comparisons. And um, I'll just, I, I won't go through them all because I can see we're running low on time. But I do want to just point out that if you look at the new objectives, they've all got greater detail, easily measurable. And a student can really clearly see what they'll be able to do at the end of all that. So let me let the mic go and pass it on to Emily. Um, sure. So uh, I'm going to be talking about aligning. And, and when we say alignment, we really mean a couple different things. And this is all based off of Quality Matters, um, which is a way of thinking about course design that was specifically designed for online and hybrid courses, but which has value for all, um, I think, all courses. So when we think about alignment, um, I'm just going to refer to those standards. Um, the course learning objectives describe outcomes that are measurable. And that's something that um, Ellen and Stephanie and Andy have already talked about. 2.2 is the module and learning objectives describe outcomes that are measurable and consistent with the course level objectives. So it's great if you have some course level objectives um, to really guide the learner and say, well, this is what, what you're going to be able to know or do at the end of this course. But um, in order for students to be self-directed learners, having module objectives so they clearly know what they're doing week by week or in a self-paced um, environment um, per module can really help them understand if they have gotten that module and they can move on to the next one and if they have a solid foundation. 3.3 is looks at, looks at the types of assessments selected to ensure that they really do measure the stated learning objectives and that they're going to be consistent with course activities and resources. So that's really making sure that what I choose for an assessment is going to be appropriate for those objectives and finding a way to align that. Oh, and I saw Claudia says, I usually include objectives in my assignment. So even going further than just the module level to the actual assignment level, and that's a really great way to make sure that everything rolls up um, and is going to have the students progress towards those course learning objectives. Terrific. So looking at objective alignment, I have a couple examples here. Um, and I think this one might actually be Ellen. So if Ellen, if you have anything to add to that, but I'll, I'll kind of get us started on this particular slide looking at the course level objective, which is to construct and present effective information and persuasive public presentations. So the module objective breaks that down a little bit to say, what are the parts, what are these small parts that a student needs to be able to do in order to reach that course level objective? So breaking it down into those little steps. Um, and this is a really good way for a student to self-assess their learning, to say, well, I can do this number one, identify the functions, but I'm having trouble with this one. And it's a really great way that the instructor and or the student can give um, and get some pinpointed feedback on where they're struggling. Um, and then looking at, well, how will the student demonstrate the knowledge for this module? And in this case, we want them to do something and to produce something, and that is construct a comprehensive speech outline, um, which really looks at the supporting material. So that gets back to that um, idea of getting um, informative and getting supporting materials in there. Um, and then also um, using credible sources. Ellen says it helps the students break down into smaller steps. Absolutely. Um, and I'm actually going to use an example. Um, this is one that is from my, not my biology um, 100 class, but the biology 100 class that is currently in development for the open course library and with the permission of the um, instructor who loves to share, um, we, we took a look at some of the um, module level objectives that support the course level objective of identify and explain the basic concepts of Mendelian genetics and inheritance. So looking at, well, how do we break that big thing down into smaller steps? And, and in the sciences, um, sometimes there tends to be more objectives 
um, than in other disciplines. So you can see that there's quite a few module objectives, and all of these will feed up and roll into that, um, that larger course objective. <laughs> and how to make mental fun. <laughs> yes. Um, and then how will, how will the students demonstrate um, their knowledge of this? Well, we're actually going to have them do something. We're going to have them use a Punnett square to illustrate probabilities of genetic inheritance. So that really gets at, yes, I'm, I'm using, I'm able to explain Mendelian genetics, and I'm able to show you what that looks like. And um, then to have them do some critical thinking, explain which ones are dominant and recessive, and write a short paragraph relating your findings to Mendelian genetics and inheritance. Let me just move on here quickly. So um, this is um, this is a, a slide um, that really looks at another objective from a human nutrition course. And um, I think some of the objective might be cut off for some people, so I'm going to just read it. The objective is discuss the roles of physiological, cultural, and environmental factors on hunger and satiation. So if we look at all the activities and all the assignments and all the assessments that really support that large course objective, um, we can see some different options broken down. And this can be a really helpful tool for you to think of, well, what are all the assignments? What are all the readings? What are all the learning materials and the assessments that support each objective? Um, so looking at the assignment, they're going to be reading some, some chapters that we're assuming are talking about hunger and satiety. Um, assignment is to view a documentary. So they're getting different um, learning um, modalities here. They're getting the, the videos and they're also getting some text and um, study guide. And the graded assignment here is to prepare a table, graphic, or timeline to demonstrate how patient Q, this kind of made up patient, so that's kind of the condition is new information here, may experience feelings of hunger and satiation from a physiological, cultural, and environmental standpoint. Briefly explain, explain the related processes or phenomenon involved. So that graded assignment really does get at that objective. And let's just imagine that there's also a graded discussion forum that says list at least one each physiological, cultural, and environmental factor that impacts hunger and satiation. And here is a really key point, which is why I put it in italics, use scientifically reasoned real life examples to demonstrate your point. So now if we took out this, um, this italicized um, sentence here, and it, they were just going to go into a discussion forum and list one physiological, cultural, environmental factor that impacts hunger and satiation, would that one activity um, be able, would you be able to assess that learning objective? And why or why not? So I'll just um, open that up for, for a little debate or some perspectives from the chat. Oh, sorry, I need to repeat the question. Um, so looking at the graded discussion form question, if we took out that italicized um, sentence to say, you scientifically reason real life examples to demonstrate your point. So if that was taken out of that assignment and we just looked at the graded discussion form question, would, would what's there truly assess the objective? And I see Kevin, Kel Kelvin is saying no. Um, and I'll wait to see some other responses too, so maybe we can think about why or why not. Everyone will say the same thing. Um, Chris says, I'm assuming they have learned what scientifically reasoned is prior to this assignment. Yes, yes. Simply creating a list does not demonstrate understanding of a concept. Um, oh, great. 
I love those that wording, Audrey. No, because the first half measures knowledge, the second sentence measures application. That's absolutely right. So if, if we want them to discuss something, simply listing will not be enough. We want them to see how they are relating it um, to scientifically reasoned real life examples. And, um, and that's why the graded assignment is important too, because it also gets them to apply. Um, nor does a list, yep, nor does a list meet the objective of discuss. And now let's look at the midterm exam. So just looking at the midterm exam, would, would, would just the midterm exam be enough for that objective, to assess that objective? Kelvin is saying no. And I think somebody already pointed out that um, the exam, a multiple choice exam, does not allow for discussion. So we're not really going to see it that. Um, so it truly doesn't assess that objective. Well, that's right. And, and um, I think that, and Jen, uh, Jennifer, step in if I'm wrong, but I think about a year ago is when I first had contact um, with, with Jennifer and, and other folks at Sailor. Because um, as far as I understand, correct me if I'm wrong, that um, courses that are designed through Sailor are um, need to have need to be administered. The assessments are administered in a multiple choice type format, but that doesn't mean you can't get at critical thinking questions. Um, and maybe this is a, a nice way to segue into questions: is how can we create multiple choice questions that get at some of the critical thinking and that are aligned with our objectives? And I'm just going to read back some of these comments here. Oh, include situations. Um, that's great. And maybe maybe there's going to be um, some examples here, like conceptual multiple choice questions. I love that idea. Um, and one one way that might be helpful for for others to think about how to write a multiple choice question that really gets at a critical thinking or, or an application skill is this might not be the appropriate level for Sailor, but if you look at um, GRE questions, the graduate record examination, or even MCAT um, or LSAT, which are standardized tests for students going into graduate level, those do a really good job at getting at critical application in multiple choice question format because they, um, they usually give the students or give the, the test takers a situation and then they have them critically analyze it through multiple choice questions. Dana says it takes a bit more time, but it's worth it. They are hard questions to write. <laughs> it's very challenging. Um, and I, I think we can transition from here to some of your ideas about um, designing assessments that, that um, are aligned with the objectives. But I want to see if there's any more slides after this one. Oh, just talking about the next webinar. So. Um, I guess at this point, should we open this up to other questions or if anybody else has ideas for how to make a multiple choice question align with objectives? I would love to, to hear some ideas um, from our presenters and our attendees. Well, one thought that comes to mind, um, stepping back from uh, the specific assignment of just saying, gee, how do we write the questions, is the notion, and I think it was Dana who, who uh, expressed it, is that this is tough work. This is difficult for instructors who are trying to um, teach a class uh, and, and deal with multiple uh, uh, demands on their time and resources to actually develop um, this kind of material. And it, you know, it, number one, the, it, it points instructors back to the publishers who've got um, a ton of resources that are available for them that can do this relatively effectively. But if we're going to have a, a, an open education uh, resource and an open education community, it also begs the question of, uh, or, you know, not the question necessarily, but it speaks to the idea of sharing across disciplines and sharing uh, within disciplines um, to a much greater extent than we're all doing right now. Um, 
you know, my two cents, and I think it, it, it speaks to the, the sharing aspect. This is Ellen. I just wanted to make a comment, Andy, when you mentioned the publishers. Um, I just wanted to throw an idea out there that when writing module level objectives, I was on um, an assessment retreat a couple years ago, and one of the ideas that we had is that when writing module level objectives, textbooks actually can be really helpful. Um, I know writing module level objectives can seem really, really overwhelming because there can be so many of them. But one idea that we had was when you use textbooks and going, um, the chapters always have those, you know, after reading this chapter, you will be able to, those can give you some great, um, great words and a great head start for writing those smaller module level objectives or at least get the get the terminology to start wordsmithing them. And I love Dina's suggestion of getting the students to uh, develop uh, assessment material. Um, the, um, one of the secrets of uh, successful online teaching, in, in my experience, was to, to do exactly that, to get students to develop not just the, uh, the course materials by having them explain, but um, have them develop assessments, problems. Uh, I taught accounting, so um, students could do this that uh, uh, you could use later, that you could recycle. Um, again, that's sharing. This is Ellen again. Pat had asked a question, um, what did I mean by wordsmithing them? Um, what I meant was when faculty looked at those um, objectives for that were written in textbooks for the chapters, sometimes they didn't like the way those were written, but they threw some of their own verbiage in there and then they felt comfortable with them. But what they liked about using the chapter, uh, the chapter, you know, terminology as a springboard at least, and then changing it up with uh, words that were comfortable or wordsmithing them, as I said, is that th at least they didn't feel like they had to reinvent the wheel. The the concepts were already laid out. Um, I just want to jump in here to second um, the idea of using textbooks or using existing materials out there for those module level objectives. I, I was doing account for another project that I'm working on, but in uh, open course library so far, I've looked at anywhere from 650 to 1,200 objectives um, within the courses I've been working in, if you consider the course objectives and the module objectives. And certainly, um, not all of those were invented by scratch, but um, another great resource to go to um, to get some module level and course level objectives is um, national um, societies um, within the disciplines, um, associations, um, can be really helpful to see what other um, scholars and experts um, within a particular field, what they think um, should be appropriate for different levels of, um, of the courses. Um. Well, I think that there have been some really helpful um, ideas written here in the chat window, and um, I'd like to, you know, first of all, I want to say, this is Jen Shoup, by the way, um, I will be making these slides available to everyone um, who would like them. I think that a lot of people express interest in that wheel graphic that Stephanie presented. Um, and I think I'll also maybe put, put some of these ideas that you've been sharing with us in the chat window down on paper just so we can, um, you know, share them and maybe keep an open Google document about it or you put it on Widgeo or something like that. Because um, I, I love these ideas for, that are coming in. And um, Gary, yes, we can, uh, we will be sending around a link to the last, we can send around the link to the last recording. There was a problem, though, with our technology at that time, so you can only hear the audio, which is so annoying. But I can also send you at least the slides um, if you'd like.
One more point I'd like to add is that I think in higher education, in a lot of different contexts, there is a big push right now for authentic assessment. So to see um, actual student products, um, so papers and um, and presentations and, and making reports, um, which which Andy was talking about a little bit. But I, I do want to say that that when you write a multiple choice question or you write an assessment question in exam format um, in a way that exposes students to a situation um, and new information and they have to synthesize that information or choose the best options, you can get at some critical thinking. Um, but certainly, yes, that is one of the challenges of writing those, um, those multiple choice questions that get at critical thinking. One other point I wanted to make quickly um, for my sailor professors. Um, so we do, um, as Emily said, you know, the only way we can really authoritatively assess students and issue a certificate of completion for a given course is through a multiple choice final exam that we administer in Moodle. But we are open to developing whatever assessments you like throughout the course, as long as there's some kind of way to give students feedback, whether that's an answer key or a guide to responding. Um, and, you know, we're much more flexible in that way. It's just that since all of the courses are for self-directed learning, there's no way to have a professor kind of say yes or no, this is right or wrong, um, or what have you. But I will also say that the next um, presentation, and I'll just, this is a nice segue into the next webinar, which will be in August. Um, you will be hearing about our e-portfolio and discussion forms, which we've just gone live with. Um, and the discussion forms, we'll be talking specifically about how you can build the discussion forms into the design of your course so that, you know, if one of your learning outcomes is, you know, be able to discuss X, Y, Z, um, you can actually build a discussion form prompt into the course itself so that when a student hits that point, um, they will be able to participate and see what other students and peers are saying um, in the discussion forum. So, and that presentation will be by Joseph, um, who here at Sailor is our strategic technology man manager, and Devin, who's our special projects administrator. So I'll be sending around um, more details on that front soon. Um, let's see, are there any, I see there's a lot of positive feedback in the chat pane, which is great. Um, so, you know, if you guys have any other questions, feel free to email them to me or um, I, I can pass them along to our very helpful um, presenters today. Um, Andy, Ellen, Emily, and Stephanie, I am so impressed with what you guys have taught me. I've learned a lot and I know that all of our professors have as well. Um, so thank you guys so much. Um, I don't know if you guys have any last words you'd like to say before we wrap this up. I just want to say thank you. Um, just reading through the chat comments, you guys have come up with some really great ideas for challenging situations. And like I said at the beginning, I'm so excited to see what Sailor is doing um, and really taking education and making it free to everybody. So I appreciate that. And you guys have re-energized me. Thanks, Emily. I mean, I, I share that. I share that same feeling. I'm totally re-energized and I'm even thinking about how to plug some of the content um, in these slides into our, our trainings and sharing them with the rest of our faculty. So I think this has been so helpful. Um, and thanks again for being here, all of you. And thank you to all of our professors and for those who um, are not affiliated with Sailor, um, I see a few of you there. Um, thanks so much for tuning in and I will definitely make a recording of this available and we'll circulate them as well as the slides and some of the great comments that have come up through the chat as well. Okay, great. Well, thank you all. Um, have a great afternoon.